let me welcome you all to um, Open Education Week at USP. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, I'll say a couple of things about Open Education Week. Open Education Week is celebrated throughout the world, uh, celebrating open education movement, everything that is about open education. I'll say a few more things about that. The, the goal of Open Education Week throughout the world is to raise awareness about the movement and its impact on teaching and learning worldwide. And over the recent years, it's become quite prominent and widely celebrated throughout the world. It, it, it is designed to highlight work um, around, um, around open education and it can involve any, any number of things. So USP is uh, celebrating Open Education Week like it has done over the last few years um, in, in, in several ways. And the most important one that's been highlighted uh, to the Open Education Consortium, which I'll say something about, is through this event. This is a, a public seminar that we organized uh, for people from within the university and outside it. But that's not the only thing that the University of the South Pacific is doing. Throughout the week, we are going to have uh, targeted workshops uh, for each faculty group on uh, issues around selection and integration of open educational resources in teaching and learning. And there's a quick uh, snapshot of what's happening. On Tuesday, um, we have a session for the Faculty of Business and Economics. And on Wednesday, we have another one for the Faculty of Science and Technology and then the Faculty of Arts on the following day. We decided to do this to give more targeted help uh, to, to the faculties, depending on what their um, uh, discipline areas are. And we are very fortunate to see, uh, perhaps I should have introduced earlier on, but I will more elaborately, uh, Professor Rory McGreal from uh, Athabasca University in Canada is here to help us through this exercise throughout the week. So there's plenty of opportunity for us to interact with him. As I was just saying, the Open Education Week is uh, promoted by the Open Education Consortium. So for those of you who are not aware, there's a bit more to read about the Open Education Consortium, which you can. On the, on the web link there. But basically it's a global network of educational institutions, individuals and organizations that support the whole notion of open education. Its mission is to promote support, promote and support and advance openness in education around the world. And of course the vision is empowerment through education and the use of open educational practices more broadly. Uh, let me say a couple of things about open education, even though I might have used the word open education 20 times in the last two, three minutes. Um, there's all sorts of um, perceptions about open education, so I think it might be useful to slow down a little bit and look at open education in these three ways. The first one is op open access, and, and those of us who have been associated with this university will 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 know what open access means. Basically, inclusive and equal access to educational opportunities without barriers. Now, there are some barriers, as we all know, but as much as it's possible, the value principle of open access is that everyone should have access to educational opportunity. That's the fundamental point there. Then there is this issue about open learning, and open learning is about strategies, about any time, anywhere, flexibility, and that's what the Center for Flexible Learning is all about. And, and, and the value principle is there that people should have the freedom and flexibility to choose the mode, the medium, time, and place. Within reason, of course, that doesn't mean that anybody can do anything at any time. The third issue about open education is open scholarship, and I know I defer to Rory on this one, he'll talk more about that, is about the release of educational resources under an open license, a different kind of license, and the value principle is that education is a basic need, it should not be kept under wrap and cover, and that it should be available to people as widely to promote issues like freedom, justice, and equality, because without education, you can't really have those kinds of things. So I, I will obviously come and revisit these things and I'll, hopefully uh, have a bit of a discussion about this uh, during the next couple of hours. 
I'll just say a couple of things about what we are doing, have been doing at the University of the South Pacific about open educational practices. As many of us will know, we have developed an open educational resources policy uh, which uh, outlines what our, our expectations are and what our, what our, our, our wishes are in terms of the use of educational resources in teaching and learning. We've also developed a repository at USP, which houses increasingly so with the help of the library. Uh, thanks, Levy. Uh, uh, setting up a place where open educational resources can be collected and distributed and used by members of the community. Um, for those of you who are also unfamiliar, there is an organization or an initiative called PACFOLD, which is an initiative that has been put together by the Commonwealth of Learning, and I'll talk more about it if there's a need to do so. And PECFOLD is uh, uh, an initiative this, that sits at USP uh, under the leadership of the Center for Flexible Learning and brings together uh, the Commonwealth of Learning and, and, and USP to promote open educational practices in, in the Pacific, in, this, in, in, the, in the region of USP. Another initiative that USP has been involved in more recently is the promotion of USP Global, which is again an initiative of the university that is designed to get education and training and skills development out to the communities as quickly as possible um, and on the job just in time to where it's required. And as part of that initiative, a number of MOOCs have been um, presented, developed and presented uh, around things like climate change, aviation law, numeracy and, uh, in particular, and, and, and public health uh, that are also in, in the pipeline. Um, uh, this is uh, 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 an image of USB Global as it is trying to upgrade the skills of people while they're on the job. So these are some of the initiatives that uh, the Center for Flexible Learning and USB has been involved in in relation to the development of open educational promotion and development of open educational practices at the university. So uh, with, with those words, introductory remarks on what we are about to celebrate, um, I want to introduce to you, a very privileged to have Professor Rory McGreal in the region. And, and Rory comes to us uh, after having spent time in Vanuatu already. Uh, and he's going to Samoa and uh, what we wanted to do is to distribute his expertise um, throughout the region as much as is possible. Uh, and, and by the way, I must publicly acknowledge and thank Rory for making this trip at his own cost and on initiative. Um, uh, so thank you, Rory, for doing that and, and being with us here. I, I, I clipped this thing out there. I tried to Google uh, Rory, and, and the, I think the first 20 hits were Rory McGreal, so I had no trouble finding more about Rory. And I, I thought I'd better read this to you. Professor McGreal is the UNESCO International Council for Open and Distance Education Chairholder in Open Educational Resources. So uh, that's, that's the most important part. He's a professor in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at Athabasca University in Canada, otherwise known as Canada's Open University, based in Alberta, northern Alberta, if I can add. He's also director of the... Uh, Knowledge Enhanced, Technology Enhanced Knowledge Research Institute, TECRI as it's called, an editor, now I know the sole editor of the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed, uh, International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning, the second most prominent journal in open and distance learning. The first one, of course, is Distance Education, edited by a guy called Sam Naidu from the University of South Pacific. Um, he has received recognition awards from the Open Education Consortium, the European Distance Education Network, and the Canadian Network of Innovation. Listen, I, I can go on. I'd rather not. You can check out Rory, and uh, much pleasure in introducing Rory to you. But before I do that, I would like to invite um, DVC Core, Education, Learning and Teaching, and Education, to say a few words and um, unleash Rory.
I like the sound of that, Unleash Rory. That's, uh, that's pretty good. I've never had that introduction before. Um, so just uh, recognition of the VC and Rory and Som and, and colleagues from USP and from outside. So um, I'm not going to say very much here because I'm sure you want to hear more from people involved in this area than me. Uh, but I just want to sort of contextualise what we're doing here a little bit in the USP bigger picture around education. So it's no secret to anyone knows anything about USP that in the last 10 years particularly we've tried to move more towards digital technologies, enhancing learning, not just providing access but enhancing uh, the learning in totally. And I think, and just so I was interested at Simon's presentation there, the mission and vision of the consortium, and it fitted very nicely USP's values about what it's trying to do in the education space right across the region as well, so a very nice fit here as well. Um, when we initially started looking in, into this area, then, then it was driven by something relatively pragmatic. In fact, it came from uh, our student association uh, and making representation at university about the unreasonable cost and lack of access to uh, textbooks. And so we started off with something fairly pragmatic. But then fitting in with that bigger picture of what we're trying to do, then it's very quickly came to the conclusion that it needs to be much more than just that. That's not without value, obviously, uh, particularly from a student's point of view, uh, but we want to do more than that as well. We want to uh, very much sort of consolidate what we're doing in the space into something that's much more educational in nature and uh, features on the pedagogies as well. So I think um, some set the scene pretty well, so I won't say a heck of a lot more, but I think I'd just like to emphasise the fact that, that this is really an exercise about uh, USP contributing to the scholarship of teaching in this area. And I think you can see from the initiatives that some put forward there that USP is really striving to take its proper place, regain its place, you might argue, um, from its, its, its work in this area in the past where we sort of went off the rails a little and now uh, particularly some appointment as uh, PVC trying to bring a much more educational focus to what we're doing here rather than a much more uh, practical focus as we have in the past. So I won't say anything more except to welcome Rory and, and our guests here today and I'm sure you're going to have a very interesting, very exciting evening tonight and, and the rest of the Open Education Week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you to everyone to uh, take time out of your evening to come to this uh, lecture. Um, I'll be talking about uh, distance education and online learning and open education resources and how they relate to us. Uh, I must say that uh, because of my position as a chair in OER, uh, you may find that my words are a little bit biased in favor of open educational resources. <clears throat> All of the slides here today are licensed under uh, Creative Commons attribution, except for some images which are under fair dealing in the Commonwealth or fair use in the United States. And uh, so they can be used for educational and research purposes. Also, I'm being uh, videotaped here, and I'm, uh, I'm being assured that this will be under a Creative Commons attribution license. I come from uh, Canada, and uh, as you can see, it's a cold place. In fact, uh, this winter has been the coldest winter in Canadian history, so it can give you a good reason of knowing uh, why I'm happy to be here in Fiji. And uh, this is a scene from our street, and uh, people are uh, uh, trying to get out of this uh, a particular storm and of course we do we laugh at the cold and the storms in Canada and in the summertime we do have a beautiful green country and uh, the summers uh, are really wonderful in Canada um, I want to talk today about the challenge of the 21st century for educators and it's this that by 2025 about a hundred million new students capable of university education um, will not be able to get it um, unless we address this problem. And uh, even looking back at, to 2015, it was estimated that we would have to build four new universities every week 
of 30,000 students in order to meet the demand. And we know that this is impossible. So we need to find new ways of delivering learning to large masses of learners, um, all in many different countries, not just in developing countries, but in the developed countries as well. There are many students capable of university who cannot attend for various reasons, either it's not accessible or they can't afford it. This is the question for us as educators in the 21st century. How do we educate all these learners? To do that, we need to look back at the economy, what's happening in the world economy. And what we see are these, uh, this fourth generation coming up of the economy that uh, started with the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, the first wave, uh, the second wave in the Industrial Revolution with the invention of the motor car. Uh, the third wave is the invention of uh, electronics and IT systems. And now we're entering the fourth wave, which uh, uh, is the cyber physical uh, systems, the internet of things and networks as represented by movements towards 5G, which will be mainly used for interlinking things uh, rather than humans. So these have been major changes in our economy, and our economy is going through this transition now, and these are accelerated changes. So whereas the first to the second took about 80 years, the second to the third about 40 years, the third to the fourth about 20 years, it's accelerating the rate of change in our economy. The economic drivers today have moved from uh, transportation and uh, manufacturing uh, to telecommunications and computing. And it's been a major change in uh, the last uh, 20, 25 years. And it's based on bits. And what are bits? People seem to think of in computers about voice, data, images. But in fact, they are all just bits running on a pipe. And uh, we envision them as voice, data, and images. Uh, but in, uh, in fact, what we're talking about is bits, bits of information. And what do we know about these bits? They have zero mass. And uh, Nicholas uh, Negroponte was the first to point it out to us. They have zero volume. They can be reproduced infinitely at virtually no cost. And they move at the speed of light. We perceive them as zeros and ones. They are not zeros and ones. It's because for our minds, human minds, we have to conceive of them and, and put them in some kind of an image or perception uh, as zeros and ones. In fact, they are on and off switches. The world economy is based on bits of information. You take a look at these two uh, USBs. One is worth $150,000. The other is worth $1.50. What's the difference? The only difference is that the bits on one are rearranged differently from the bits on the other one. The only change has been this rearrangement of bits of information, ones and zeros, on and off switches. The world economy is based on this difference. Take a look and you see the largest companies in the world, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, uh, which uh, owns Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Alibaba, Berkshire Hathaway. These are all based on bits of information. They are larger than uh, product producers like Walmart, ExxonMobil, General Electric. Um, Uber and Airbnb straddle both the world. Um, it's very important for us to understand this, that these bits of information drive the world economy. Things do not drive the world economy. It's these bits of information and the characteristic about them, zero mass, zero volume, they can be moved infinitely around the world 
And uh, uh, that is the basis of our economic system. And these uh, uh, 10 companies all show that. These are the most highly valued uh, uh, on the stock market companies in the world. And they are all primarily, if not totally, based on bits of information. And what do we know about them? And what do they, um, what do they produce, these companies? Nothing. They don't produce anything. All they do is rearrange ones and zeros. And yet this is the basis of our economy today. The United States is a major exporter of cultural products and has therefore unsurprisingly made stronger copyright protection a core element of its trade strategy. And because of this bits economy is the leading countries in this economy are trying to uh, tighten up their grip and control over these bits of information. And this is a world map showing where royalties go to for copyright and other intellectual property. Over 50% of the world's royalties go to the United States. The other big ones you see there are Europe and Japan, where they have about 80% of world's royalties. That is why these are the leading countries promoting very strict and restrictive uh, copyright. And make no mistake about it, they are pushing it and forcing it on other countries. And we are being forced, the smaller countries who are not in on this game are being forced to accept it. The Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement is one example of that. However, we do know this. We talk about these ones and zeros. This concept is not new. It doesn't belong to the United States. The Chinese were talking about this 5,000 years ago with the yin and the yang, dividing reality into two aspects. This is a very old concept. Could you imagine if we had to pay royalty to China for every bit that was being produced? The Singapore government many years ago, tw over 20 years ago, recognized this. They said global competition in telecommunications is an overwhelming and irreversible tide. We can neither go against, alter, nor shut out this tide. We will simply be bypassed and rendered irrelevant. And I would suggest that since then, we can talk about education, that global competition in education is the same. Is there's huge competition around the world in education. Aranovitz and DeFazio put it this way. Not only has abstract knowledge come to the center of the world's political economy, but there is also a tendency to produce and trade in symbolic significations rather than concrete products. Today, knowledge rather than traditional skill is the main productive force. The Irish poet uh, Yeats put it this way, uh, the visible world is no longer a reality and the unseen world is no longer a dream. Economic activity is going to learning and training, whereas in 2000, 25% of economic activity is uh, uh, education. By 2020, we're talking as much as 60% of economic activity revolves around learning and training. And by this, we mean this. If you have construction workers, they're spending a huge amount of time being trained and retrained. If you have electricians, they're being trained and retrained. In every sphere, the oil industry, in every in industry, or what we consider uh, major industries, education and training is becoming more and more a percentage, greater percentage of the part of activity in that economic sector. And so education and tra training are becoming the center of the world economy. And what are we? We are educators. We are the ones who are at the center of the world economy. We are the ones who are working to transmit knowledge, to transfer knowledge to different people. And so we should understand that and understand the importance of our position in this new economy. 
Make no mistake, it, mistake about it, personal livelihoods are threatened. New markets are up for grabs and national fortunes are at stake and they depend on how we react uh, to this new world economy. Taichi Sakaya wrote a book, The Knowledge Value Revolution. And in this book, what he claims is that uh, we have always been buying the knowledge. Um, when we take any device, this for example, what are we buying? Are we buying the plastic and metal that's in here, the wires? No. We're buying the knowledge that is embedded in this object. The plastic, the wires, the uh, metal is worth about 10 cents. The knowledge is worth about uh, 50 bucks. And then they sell it for 200, the profit. But you're buying knowledge. And it's the same in, in Alberta. We have the great oil industry. And it's based on uh, uh, tar sands where they take the muck out and they convert it into oil. And they say, this is our biggest industry. Well, I'll tell you something. If we didn't have educated engineers and skilled work people, all we would have in northern Alberta is sticky mud. That's the only thing we would have. And when people are buying the oil, they are also buying the knowledge and skills that have been put into that object by the people who have been trained. And our job is training and educating those people. So let's get real and understand the importance of education in the new economy. Societies that have a strong coherent sense of what is important and a collective will will probably be the most uh, successful. So, we move to learning and training. We can say this, that human capital has never been so important. Finding training and keeping knowledge workers is crucial for the economy. And there's increased mobility of the workshop, especially with the internet, where you don't have to be in any one site, any particular site. We can work from anywhere. There's a growing need for a continually educated workforce. Work is learning and learning is work, as Harold Yarkey reminds us. It is a major business mistake when learning is not connected to working. We have work skills and soft skills, and the top five skills in demand, communication skills, ability to work in a team, problem solving skills, leadership skills, and a strong work ethic, as identified by employers. However, these employers make the assumption that the workers have the knowledge and skills requisite for that particular job. They just assume that, and they assume that you have those knowledges and skills requisite for that job, and plus communication skills, ability to work, problem-solving skills, etc. We need to start thinking, we've been hearing a lot for the past 20 years about learner-centeredness. We need to start thinking in terms of learning-centered. We've got to uh, make sure that we are able to teach students more effectively, more efficiently, and that they learn better. That Yes, they need to be engaged, they need to be challenged, um, you need relevant uh, work, etc. But we're talking about learning. Our focus is not on the learner. Our focus is ensuring that learning takes place. And yes, we need to understand the learner, but we also need to understand the teacher. We need to understand the administration. We need to understand the society, the environment, the politics, the technology. There are many things in the learning system. And by focusing on one aspect of the system, we have been ignoring the others. And we need to start rethinking about learning. Because learning, as we, uh, as we 
uh, put, uh, showed you earlier is central to the knowledge economy. So let's get away from all of the learner-centeredness and move to learning. And I, uh, I recently wrote a, an editorial for our journal. I'm the editor of uh, the International Review of an Open and Dist Distributed Learning. And uh, I'm just fed up of research coming in about how happy the students were. Oh, they were very satisfied. These students were empathizing. They interacted all the time. And they don't mention whether they learned anything or not. Well, no, we've got to focus on learning. And I believe that yeah. if they're happy and they're uh, empathetic, etc., that this will help learning. But we focus on the learning. Is how about if they're unhappy and uh, uh, unempathetic and they learn a lot? How about that? So we need to rethink the way we've taken in the last 20 years this whole notion of learner-centeredness. Our key question is, did the learners, did the students learn anything? Technology skills are needed. We need continuing research, development, and innovation. The single greatest challenge facing managers in developed countries of the world is to increase the productivity of knowledge and service workers. How can emerging technologies be used by developed countries to teach ever-increasing numbers of students while at the same time assisting developing countries in educating their people? Goes back to my original premise. The main challenge for educators, the 21st century, is how do we educate all these people? And technology is certainly part of that. By embracing and promoting open source software, OER, open courses, and open scholarship for student credit. E-skills, the definition, capacity, these skills and abilities to exploit tacit and explicit knowledge, as well as to use digital technologies in information management and knowledge production. How are skills acquired? Many ways, formal education, work experience, natural abilities, training on the job, other ways, self-training, non-formal learning, many different ways that people learn. We need to take advantage of all of them, and again, by thinking of learning as a system. We need to be in a permanent state of reinvention, learn how to learn, learn how to unlearn, because as the world changes, some of our old habits need to be stopped, and we start new habits. And of course, we need to multitask uh, to the maximum. And uh, uh, this is a major uh, issue now where multitasking is becoming essential in many fields. Now, how do employees prefer to learn? Well, 58% of employees prefer to learn at their own pace. 68% prefer to learn at work. And 49% prefer to learn at the point of need, just when they need it. That's the best time to learn. And 90% of companies today offer digital learning. And it goes back to what I was saying before, that learning is part of your job, and it's becoming more and more part of your job. The top three online learning industry trends for talent developers, micro-learning, learning spots, different skills, little things, uh, little bits of knowledge. Just in time learning, just when you need it. You look it up on the web, you get the information you need. Employee experience with engaging content is uh, games, for example. There are personal devices in the workplace. Three quarters of employees use multiple gadgets for work-related purposes. And here's 80%, the proportion of employees using personal devices for work. Note, in India, 80%. In China, 92%. This is becoming endemic around the world. And there's been a major shift in computing away from desktops, mobile phones, and now tablets have becoming huge. So we need to have multiple ways of designing our courses 
for use to access the information using these different devices. There's a growing mobile workforce, 1.3 billion worldwide working as mobile workers using their mobile phones, tablets, and other mobile devices. Which brings us to the whole point of mobile learning. I got into this in 1999. I was driving through a small village in the Philippine Islands. And I slammed on the brakes because I could not believe what I saw. Standing in a field was a farmer up to his knees in a rice paddy, and he was digital messaging. In 1999 in Canada, nobody was digital messaging. We had no digital messaging. I checked online, and I found out that in 1999, the Philippines did more digital messaging per capita than any other country in the world. Oh, you're so kind. Do I feel, do I sound hoarse? <laughs> I checked again this year, and the Philippines still does more digital messaging per capita than any other country in the world. But what woke me up was I looked at it, and I realized that that mobile phone that he had in his hand was more powerful than the computer I had on my desktop two years earlier. And I thought then, wow, these are powerful devices. How can we use these for learning? And of course, the mobile traffic is growing very rapidly. There's uh, as a percentage of total uh, internet traffic. Uh, mobility adoption is going up uh, uh, incredibly fast, even in India and in developing countries, even faster than in the developed world. And towards mobile first, you can see now 50% in Asia uh, don't use the internet on a PC. Only 25% use the internet on a PC in the United States. So there's been some massive changes in the world. And here how people learn in uh, the modern workplace, and um, you can see the graph value up this way, autonomy, uh, learning, they prefer individually, uh, autonomous, it has the highest value for them, and it gives them the most self-improvement, and the least is the old formal learning from instruction. So, let's wake up and smell the coffee. Mobile learning, there's four and a half billion mobile subscriptions, one and a half billion mobile internet users. More time is spent on the internet with mobile than with desktops. 90% of the world's population is covered by cellular. One out of three people only access the internet using mobile devices. So let's get real. The world economy is online. The world economy is global. Therefore, students should be online. Students should be global. Virtual mobility is part of the world that we live in. What does that mean for us as educators? Is design for mobile first. Do not design for paper. Do not design for your desktop. Design for mobile first. Because if you design for mobile first, you can easily put it on paper. You can easily transfer it to paper. You can easily put it on your desktop. But the other way around, it doesn't work uh, quite as well. So I think that's an important lesson for us as educators. Of course, in Canada, we had the first cell phone uh, with integrated uh, camera. Now, what's this? Hearables. What are hearables? They're wireless, smart microcomputers with artificial intelligence, with a speaker and microphone. They fit in your ear. You connect to the internet and other devices, and they're designed to be worn daily. It's a very high-level computer that you stick in your ear, and you talk to it, and it talks to you. And these are now coming on the market. They've just arrived in late 2017. They're beginning to get going 2018. 2019, we're going to see some uh, developments. 
They're tiny, they're nearly weightless, they perfectly fit in the ear canal. Um, they're comfortable over time. They have sufficient battery power, strong antennas. They have a microphone as well as a speaker. So you speak to them, they, it can speak to you. And there's a very high level uh, microprocessor. And here's some of the old uh, hearable devices, headphones, sound amplifiers, earbuds, hearing aids, etc. And we've moved from that um, to these very uh, high, um, uh, high quality uh, products that cancel out unwanted background noise. They amplify the voice of a particular person and they allow you to converse in another language. But there's been a stigma to hearing aids. They're identified with old men like me and young cool kids don't want to be wearing them. And so they're trying to overcome this. How can we make these devices uh, sexy and not be identified with old, uh, old guys? And they're coming up with new designs for hearables so as people will be very happy uh, to be wearing them and talking with them. They have inter intelligent voice recognition. There's an int intelligent virtual assistant. So you ask it, you have a problem, you ask it, it responds to you. And it also uh, uh, monitors you. Here's some of them here. They use iTranslate. The braggy dash is one uh, uh, type of uh, hearable. They're a subset of wearables. So you have glass, uh, Fitbits, uh, uh, self-lacing shoes, uh, cool shirts with the computers in the shirt, and hearables are a subset of these wearables. And they're also a subset of audibles, where you, many people now at home, you have your Amazon Echo, and you ask it, I wake up in the morning and I say, uh, good morning, Alexa, and Alexa says, good morning, the temperature outside is such and such and everything. And then I go in the kitchen and my wife says to me, you never said good morning to me. Yeah. These audibles become very human, uh, human-like. And uh, there's others, Cortana, Google Assistant, Siri on your iPhone. Um, hearables are a subset of these audibles and they're a subset that you can carry around with you wherever you go so you can get information on the fly all the time or receive it. Um, Night Lab calls it an interface revolution. Just-in-time learning. Very effective for just-in-time learning. People, when they're fixing a device, they can actually talk to the guidebook and get information on the guide of what they're fixing and how to go about it correctly. Um, a salesperson learning on the job while they're driving to their meet a client, they can ask all kinds of questions and get information about the client and about the product that she's selling. They can be used for self-directed learning. And that is people just on their own, uh, they can uh, take whatever they want to learn and ask the device and the device will find the information on the internet and respond. Personal learning and connectivism. They're context aware, um, they're adaptive, they're individualized, and they can work with personalized learning networks. All of these things are possible with hearable devices. However, um, they can also remind us, um, like uh, Julius Caesar, sorry, it wasn't Julius, Augustus Caesar hired a slave to stand behind him when he was in a parade and keep telling him, memento homo, remember, you are a man, remember, you are a man. And your hearable device can also do that. It can keep you humble. It also, by the way, it can tell you more about yourself than you know yourself. It, it, it monitors your heartbeat. It can tell you when you're near having a heart attack. It can monitor your... Uh, um, uh, sugar level, it can monitor all kinds of uh, physical attributes and warn you if there's a problem coming. So, 
These devices, mobile learning, hearables, they're all part of the new technologies that are coming up to be used for distance education. And uh, I'm going to talk now about how people sometimes compare traditional education with distance education. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that the emperor has no clothes, that traditional education is in no way, uh, in any way, superior uh, to distance education. People who believe that traditional education is superior to online distance education, we call them the educational Amish. These are people in Canada and in the United States who choose to live in the 19th century. The world has passed them by, but they want to live like people lived in the 19th century. And these are the people who believe that traditional education is somehow superior to online learning, to distance education. Uh, they have no evidence for it, uh, but like the Amish, they choose to hold themselves back and remain in the 19th century. They don't realize that the 20th century has passed and we're now in the 21st century. Tom Russell exposed this many years ago with his no significant difference phenomenon. More than 355 studies showing that regardless of the technology or media, including the classroom, online internet, uh, video, audio, um, that there's no significant difference in the achievement level of students. So, let's get with it. Online education is essential for a modern education. Anyone today getting a modern edu getting any education who thinks they're getting a real education, who is not online, who is not using digital devices, is not getting a modern education. I liken it this way, as Hampton put it way back in 1991, that distance education, Cinderella, has become the princess. That uh, before it was seen that, oh, distance education, it's okay for people who can't get a real education. Well, no, not anymore. Cinderella is the princess, and now traditional universities are coming to own online universities and asking this, how do you do that? How do we participate? And in fact, in Canada, uh, there are no universities that are not online. Every university now has some portion of distance education. Games can be used for learning. Very important that uh, we've discovered that one of the most efficient and effective ways of learning is through games. Uh, who here has heard of the twitch as a unit of measurement? Good, somebody knows something about game, game design. It's equal to two jiffies, or 200 milliseconds, and it's the amount of time it takes to move a joystick in one direction or press a button. In 200 milliseconds, electrons on a wire can travel 20,000 kilometers. Guess what? There is nowhere on Earth further away than 20,000 kilometers. What does that tell us? That God, in his or her infinite wisdom, designed the world perfectly for playing video games. We need to take advantage of that as educators. And uh, we need to push MOOCs. I could give a whole talk about MOOCs. I just uh, want to remind you of uh, one thing about MOOCs, is they were not invented in the United States. They were invented in Canada. And we I was one of the participants in the first MOOC, along with Stephen Downs and George Siemens. Now, open educational resources, we believe, are essential in promoting this new digital online world that is going to reach education to everybody. And the 2012 Paris OER Declaration, uh, which supports the goal, education for all, strategic goal four, education for all. And the United Nations, Commonwealth of Learning, many other organizations saying, we need OER in order to achieve that goal. And OER, um, what are they? They could be textbooks, they could be uh, modules, they could be text, they could be games, they could be videos, they could be audio resources, 
They can be curriculum material. The key point of OER is that they are openly licensed for you to use any way you want to use it. That's the key of what open educational resources are. And uh, they are Creative Commons license, attribution, Creative Commons attribution means anyone can use our work, but they must attribute it. And of course we know that because if we don't, it's plagiarism. So we know we must have attribution. We can have share alike, and that means anyone can use and change this content any way they want, but they must keep the same license on it. Um, the other two, we do not recommend that you use. Um, but they do have purposes in some instances, uh, they're good to have. No derivatives mean nobody can change it or make any, any change without the permission of the author. They can't translate it without the permission of the author. Uh, Non-commercial means you can't make money off it without the permission of the author. And these are good in certain circumstances. We don't recommend it because we want the works to be open to everybody and if you start mixing up licenses, it becomes very difficult in mixing and matching OER and putting courses together. We also have fair dealing in the uh, common law countries, which I, I believe uh, Fiji is a common law country. Fair use in the United States, fair dealing in uh, most of the common, uh, common law countries. And uh, this is very important for education, is there are all kinds of things we can use on the internet. We can download, distribute them in our classes. We can do many things with them and we're legally allowed to do that with portions of work. And I say this because you should become familiar with the Pentalogy decision of the Canadian Supreme Court. This is the only decision of any Supreme Court in any common law country. And so it's a very important decision. And basically, um, what the Supreme Court said was that fair dealing must, must, be given a large and liberal interpretation. And what it says is this, is you can take a reasonable amount of commercial content and you can use it for research or education. And what is a reasonable amount? You ask yourself this question, am I a reasonable person? If the answer is yes, you ask yourself, does this seem reasonable? And if the answer is yes, it probably is reasonable and you can use it. And uh, in some countries like Australia now, they have a 10% rule, but that's not in other countries. We have a reasonable amount. 10% uh, of some things that may be quite reasonable, maybe 20% is reasonable. Maybe if you have a picture, 100% could be reasonable. Um, and what you have to do is look at it as a reasonable person and there are some tests you can use in order to determine that. But uh, what I want to emphasize here for you is take advantage of this fair dealing. Use commercial content, portions of it. Don't take a whole book and copy it. But if you take a chapter or two, there's no problem. This is fair dealing. And you are allowed to do it. And it is part of copyright law. You have every right to do that and make use of that material. And... Uh, uh, the European Union, which comes under the, uh, uh, most of them under the Napoleonic Code and, and uh, a different uh, legal tradition, even they are pushing now for the civil society proposed treaty on copyright exceptions for education and research. And again, they're saying the same thing. You can make copies for teaching, learning and research, for performing works, for marking, co making quotations, Images and excerpts, translating. You can use or orphan works. You can do it for people with disabilities. You can import works. Computing, indexing, texting, and data mining. You can use commercial content for all of those things. Copying is not piracy. Now, why open educational resources? And we all know there's huge savings possible 
There's estimated now, the recent estimate in the United States, $177 million have been saved by uh, students. I know in our university it's approaching $2 million alone by using open educational resources. Huge savings for students. But the real reason, and the reason I got into it, was many years ago when we were discussing learning objects, is that we found out that if we had copyright on the content that we were sharing among five different universities, the legal agreements that we would have to go through would cost us more money than we were getting in our grant. And we decided we had to move away from them. But they use, the commercial content providers now use digital rights management, digital locks. They put a technological lock on the content. And they support this with digital licenses. I call it digital restrictions management, not digital rights management. And if we go back to this old poem, Stealing the Goose, they hang the man and flog the woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the goose. Notice that even in those days, they were very sexist. They treated men and women quite differently. And uh, <clears throat> I say this poem is because with these digital locks, they are trying to close off the internet and have different uh, ownership parts, private gardens, etc., and trying to stop us from uh, accessing the uh, content that is, belongs to all of us. With digital rights management, you get an e-learning course uh, you, you pay for. You can't copy and paste. You can't text to speech. You cannot change the format. You can't move it, you can't print it out, you can't go to another country with it, you can't use it after an expiry date, you can't resell it. The locks prevent you from doing any of those things. And they talk about intellectual property. It is not intellectual property. What they have is a monopoly over the use of their content. They do not, it is not property. This is property. This is physical property. I own this. My device is my property. Digital rights management, the locks, interfere with my right to use my property. They, they want to own and control how I use property that I own. And it's because of their monopoly. It is not property. The term intellectual property is uh, a... Uh, a fiction, it's Orwellian language. They have a privileged monopoly to control their content and uh, impose restrictions on you and on your property. They put locks on your devices, but we're innocent. They lock up our device even though we're innocent. And they've even suggested uh, uh, blowing up your device if you uh, use pirated software or what they think is pirated software. And you can laugh at this, but uh, such a law was actually introduced into the U.S. Congress. Luckily, it didn't pass. So they do think that way. Now, worse than the digital locks, because to be honest with you, we know anybody, we can break the digital locks. This is not a problem. No matter what lock they create, we'll break it. We can get around it. So what they do is they bring in these digital licenses. How many of you have read a digital license? You know when you click on I agree? How many of you actually read the license? What? I'm the only nerd in the room. I'm the only one who reads digital licenses. Some of them, I don't blame you, some of them are 60 to 70 pages long. So it's easier to just click on I agree. But when you click on that I agree, you've agreed that you cannot do anything that the technological restrictions, uh, the digital locks stop you from doing. You've agreed you can't copy or text to speech or change it or print it out or move it. You've agreed to that. You've also agreed that owners have no liability, even if the product doesn't work. And we know in common law countries, there's a liability. If I sell you something, there's an assumption that it works. And if it doesn't work, you have to put as is on the contract. 
So, but you've agreed that no, they don't have that liability at all. You've also agreed that they can invade your computer without your permission at any time and come in and collect and use your personal data. You've agreed not that they can use your personal data only in reference to their, their courseware. You've agreed that they can use any of your personal data on your computer. You've also agreed that you don't own it. You have a privilege to use the product. You don't own it. And you're prohibited to show your content to others. And because of United States pressure around the world, this is a criminal offense. If you're reaching, reading a really juicy part of Fifty Shades of Grey or something, and you want to show it to your uh, significant other, you've broken the law. You're a criminal. You could go to jail for this. You are not allowed to do that. That is against the law. Criminal. It's a criminal offense. And uh, so um, you also must accept that you have no rights. I talked earlier about having fair dealing rights. You've agreed that you don't have any rights. You've clicked on it and agreed to all that. So these digital licenses are even more restrictive. Vendors can control how, when, where, and with what specific brands of technological assistance audiences are able to access content. They brought a new concept into the world. You buy, but you don't get. Do you remember? The world we used to live in where you bought something, you got it. Do you remember that world? If you bought a hammer, nobody could tell you what kind of nails to use. If you bought a screwdriver, you could use any kind of screws you wanted. Now you buy it and they control how, when, where, and, and in what way you use the device. You buy, but you don't get. It's a new world for us. And Cory Doctorow calls it a return to feudalism, where the lords owned everything and we just worked for them. And now it's companies that own everything and not aristocrats. And if you think it's serious for open education and uh, in, in our context, think of this. A farmer in Saskatchewan bought a Massey Ferguson tractor and he bought it second hand and he brought it to his farm and it didn't work. Massey Ferguson had uh, deleted the software from his tractor. And they said, it's gonna cost you $10,000 for the software. And he'd bought the tractor second hand from another one, but the guy could sell the tractor, but he couldn't sell the, the software belonged to Massey Ferguson. And he said, oh my God, I've got to get out there on my field. And any of you know anything about farming is when you've got to go in the field, you've got to go in the field. That's the day you have to go in the field. He couldn't wait 10 days for the guy to come up, drive up to northern Saskatchewan and install the software. So he was stuck. Lucky for him, he had a 12-year-old son who understood how to use the internet and the dark web. He went online and he found the software that was needed and he, his 12-year-old son installed it on the tractor. But this was illegal. This is a criminal offense to do that. Um, but he had to do it. And if you think it's just tractors, think of other things. Uh, your car. You don't own your car anymore. It can't run without that computer software. You don't own the software. They can do what they want with it. They can disable your car if they feel like it. Um, other things, uh, vibrators, uh, heart pump. You have a heart pump, you don't own the software on it. They own it. Um, all kinds of devices now, we're in that situation where they own it and we don't. So what do we do? What can we do as educators? Openness is the skeleton key that unlocks every attempt at vendor control and lock-in. And it's like this, Lawrence Lessig put it this way, Britney Spears, needs content, needs copyright to protect her songs. That's wonderful, let her have it. In education, we don't need it. Let's go open. Let's not fight them and their strict copyright. They'll go strict and strict and stricter on copyright. We go open and we start using open educational resources and ignore them. 
get away from the big publishers. And uh, um, a lot of this is covered in, uh, in this book, in the Commonwealth of Learning, Open Educational Resources, Policy, Costs, and Transformation. Um, again, anyone interested in research about open education resources, um, go to the OER Knowledge Cloud. There's over 3,000 uh, reports and scholarly lit pages, papers about open educational resources. Assessment and credentials are also important. Credit transfer is a really major issue. Um, it's easy in North America to transfer your credits between universities in the first two years. It's problematic in the upper levels. The Bologna process is attempting to do that in Europe to allow for the transfer of credit credentials and assessment. And the Commonwealth of Learning has uh, developed the transnational qualifications framework for the virtual university of the small states of the Commonwealth with procedures, guidelines to translation, accreditation and recognition. And it allows people uh, to go from one country to the other and have their credentials recognized. This is very important for Canada. In Canada, we have a huge number of immigrants who get in because they're highly educated, we allow them in. And then we don't recognize their qualifications. It's a real problem. We have, we have some of the most educated taxi drivers in the world. they very extremely well-educated people and they don't get their qualifications recognized. So we need to work for these. Things like recognition of prior learning is important. Have processes for that. Challenge for credit. If somebody says, uh, yes, I know second year French, let them do a test and yes, they do and give them the credit for that. So there's all kinds of different ways of uh, 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 doing challenge for credit. Oh, going backwards. And um, this problem, learners who access OER and acquire knowledge and skills, they can't have their learning assessed and accredited. The OERU is uh, based uh, in New Zealand, uh, 30 institutions on all continents um, working together, basically because present systems are unsustainable, present systems are not scalable, uh, we need to find new cost-effective learning systems with higher quality. And we believe that OER will be part of the solution for many learners. And the concept goes like this. Learners access courses based on OER. Open student support via academic volunteers and uh, student volunteers. They get open ass assessment from participating institution. The institution grants the credit and the student gets a credible degree. And so it creates a pathway uh, to have their learning recognized. And here's another way of looking at the model. Your typical university, it's our students using our faculty, taking our courses, and they get our credential. The OERU model is any learner anywhere using any faculty, using any course materials, but if they want a Athabasca University credential, they take our test, our assessment. If they want a University of Southern Queensland credential, they take their assessment. And that's the OERU model. We call it the anti-MOOC. Disaggregation is coming on. You know all of the different services in universities, credentialing, assessment, support, they all can be disaggregated and done separately. It's like the no frill stores, banking, groceries, department stores, travel agencies, accommodations, etc. No frills, uh, you just take the ba you get the basics. In education, we can do it. It can uh, reduce the cost of gaining accreditation. It reduces the cost of infrastructure. The loyalty of alumni for established institutions is not needed. Uh, the lack of government funding means we have to find cheaper ways of working and it's an anti-commercial culture. So, no frills universities, students may abandon the full service. A discount service could replace it and it may reduce sustainability of full service. 
we need to ask ourselves, do we need and can we afford the full, the full bundle? The freedom of learners has to enroll in and complete courses at institutions of their choice, to change institutions as they strive to complete a program, to transfer credits among institutions, and to have their learning assessed and accredited. This gives freedom for learners. Professor Whitesize put it this way, affordability in the future may be the first requirement, not an afterthought. The race may not be to the swift, but to the cheap. And I want to finish with this story about the frog. You've probably heard the story. You put a frog in water, you slowly heat up the water till it boils, and he can't jump because by the time he realizes it, his legs are cooked and he can't jump and he dies. And I tell this story because the technology is bubbling all around us. And at some point, we've got to jump. And if we don't jump, we're going to be cooked. Well, I put this story out on the internet. And I got an email from another country. And it said, I'm very sorry, uh, uh, Dr. McGrail, but uh, at 44 degrees Celsius, a knee-jerk reaction in the something, something left anterior something of his muscles causes the frog to automatically eject itself from the water. And I thought, oh my God, because of my story, there's people around the world putting frogs in water and boiling them. <laughs> and I had to put out a disclaimer. I put a disclaimer out. I said, look, uh, I said, I come from the maritime region of Canada, and there we don't let the facts interfere with a good story. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Rory has given us a lot to think about, a lot, um, and, and wide-ranging. Uh, I almost wanted to describe him as a jihadist of sorts, you know. Uh, it sounded like one as far as OER is concerned. So uh, my first question, uh, first point really to, to the panel is, it would, would go somewhat like this. If I were one of you, I'd be thinking, well, what was it that, um, that uh, you would want to rebut, or you want to argue against, you know? Or was it, um, what's your take? What's your take on what Rory has just said in the last 40 minutes or so? So you could either, either take a point or rebut him or nail him or whatever, or, or you, could, you could make a comment. I mean, that, that's an um, obvious broad question. So without forcing you into any particular question, I wanted to sort of leave it to you. So could we start with you, Matthew? Go for it. Uh, so the, sorry, uh, you see the question is, how would I like to rebut the, the speech that I just had? <laughs> is this thing? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't like to rebut it at all. Um, I would just observe that uh, in, the, in the material reality underneath the open principles that were just eloquently and convincingly described, uh, individual academics working within the university have two choices, even if they fully agree. With, uh, with professor's comments. One is to resign from the university and go rogue, and the other one is to try and operate within the structures of the university while nevertheless adhering to or working towards the, the ideals that, that we heard. Um, I'm more inclined towards the latter, and in that respect, I think that, uh, that yeah, for if we're gonna be in, to encourage academics to begin with, let's say, publish uh, in an open, under open principles, we should try and encourage the university to recognize that. And that would take a leap of faith on the part of the, the frog or the university to, um, yeah, to, in effect, opt out of or at least qualify what is the world system of recognition of the value of universities and the, uh, the competencies of universities and reward publications in, in open journals and in, in open forums. Uh, that's a difficult thing for university to agree to because the university is also bound by material requirements under this system. Yeah, so it's not at all a rebuttal, just a, an observation to that effect. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I really like that point. You started with zero ones and microprocessors. That's what I do teach in my course here. Exactly zero ones. Uh, it's all my three units cover all these zeros ones, but mainly the programmings and hardware stuff and all. But really, uh, the point that open education, I, I, from science and technology perspective, uh, we do have some couple of online units, and uh, we do run uh, online courses also. But I'm still uh, very much confused with open education and resources and open university, which deliver the units that you study and clear uh, through online mode and face-to-face -face, uh, uh, delivery. And so the point that uh, that relevant to us, uh, however, like time is moving and we do try to give our materials through uh, <laughs> online uh, resources and Moodles and uh, tablets and etc. with so many new technological things also we adopted. But still, uh, we do have some queries and questions about software delivery and uh, hardware prospects about this. So, so, the, so one of the point that you did mention about uh, copyrights, hardware and software, because both firms and developers are separate. So they don't uh, work together. They, uh, the, the hardware, they have not uh, paid uh, the copyrights to the software people. So they do keep their own licensing, uh, their own. So that could be the one point that while we move towards uh, online delivery, this uh, point is always come up, even though we buy hardware uh, and we pay for hardware. So it doesn't mean that whatever the open source software we in, uh, install in that system, it will not be accepted. Uh, and uh, it's a fully copyright. So, so these are the points really kicking some of the new points to talk and think about it. And we really enjoy this. Okay, my issue also relates to copyright. You referred to the Canadian Supreme Court of Canada law. Now, our students here, we subscribe to um, journals from Elsevier, etc. How would we refer to the Canadian Supreme Court of Canada law when we're here in Fiji and trying to deal with Elsevier? Our copyright law in Fiji says 10%, and we don't have any too much freedom to move into the reasonable component that you spoke about. Could you say something on that? Because I can't see that happening here. I'd like to see it happen. Uh, how would I make it happen here? Thank you. Um, I particularly enjoy the analogies of the, um, the Amish and the frog. Uh, and you know, it, it just reminds me as I reflect that the world is changing and we have the opportunity to seize the opportunities um, and move at our own choice rather than one day finding that the world has moved past us and we haven't been responsive enough, we haven't been agile enough. So I really enjoyed those analogies. Uh, two points that I'd like to highlight at this stage, some of the practical issues dealing with open education resources. Uh, one of them is around the quality, assurance of the quality of the open education resources. I think that's a major consideration for many disciplines, particularly those with accreditation. Um, so assurance around the quality of the open education resources. Uh, the second one is the mindset uh, within our region that still favors what we might call traditional face-to-face -face learning. Uh, and we are being asked uh, even by certain governments, member governments, to provide uh, that face-to-face -face learning. So I guess face-to-face -face learning can still incorporate some open education resources, uh, but in some ways we're being asked to keep uh, the traditional model of face-to-face -face learning in the classroom. Uh, which may work against our attempts to pursue uh, more online education. Um, there was another point I was going to mention. Uh, oh, yes, um, which I see as an opportunity. So going back to the analogies of the Amish and of the frog, when we, one of our responsibilities is to review proposals for new courses or conversion of courses from the face-to-face -face mode to online mode or blended mode. 
and there is a section in that for monopoly education resources. Uh, and sometimes we get comments like, okay, you know, there aren't many OERs in this area. So I see that as an opportunity, okay, if there aren't, if there really aren't, then surely this is the opportunity for us to develop them uh, and to take advantage of that. So those are my initial comments. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, I'll try to remember, I'm an old man, but I'll try to remember them. As far as uh, um, government supporting traditional education, um, you've got to get them out. Uh, these people are dinosaurs. The world is online. If they can't see that, what are they doing in your government? I mean, we see it all. I, Brazil was the worst case where uh, they demanded that 80% uh, of all education must be in a classroom. Why do they demand that? 80% of all jobs, maybe 90%, are online or with computers or one way or another. So, like, it, um, it doesn't make any sense for educated people uh, to do that. So, um, I wouldn't have any patience with them. And some knows as a jihadist, I guess I am, is I have no patience with these people. These are dinosaurs. And you need to get people in who understand what's happening with the economy. Am I right about the economy or wrong? I mean, you look at the 10 top uh, companies in the world, and they're all digital. I mean, they're online. The world is online. So you want it to be like the Amish, with all, every, all world is online except for us in education. In education, we'll stick to the 19th century. This is absurd. I, I just don't see it. Now, for the copyright uh, issue, if you're stuck with the 10% that they... Uh, uh, shoved onto Australia, and I do mean that, the U.S. shoved it onto them, and uh, you can check with WikiLeaks, they have documentation on that. They tried to shove it onto Canada as well. Uh, we resisted, but we gave in on the uh, digital locks. Uh, then you have to uh, take the 10% um, with, with the proviso that this is, a, this is not a hard and fast rule, 10%. Is you can, if it's a picture, you can take 100% of a picture, a photo, whatever. You can do these things. And uh, if I were you, I uh, take as liberal an interpretation as well. If somebody takes 13 or 14% or even up to 20%, leave it alone. They're not going to sue you. They're frightened to death to sue us. Um, they got these, these open laws in Canada because they were stupid. They sued the Law Society of Upper Canada. Big mistake, they lost completely. And then the second uh, time they tried uh, suing, uh, they lost even more. They sued the kids, the K to 12 schools, and uh, uh, no public sympathy whatsoever. They're not gonna sue anyone anyway. So yeah, I still say you can take it. Take the liberal view uh, as, as is the only um, judgment in any common law country. Take it as wide as you can and don't, uh, um, don't be stopping people, and, and don't be the, the one who, who enforces copyright uh, onto people uh, who, are, who are around that. Obviously, I'm not saying copy the whole thing. You can't do that, we know that. Now, for, <laughs> hey, my memory's not as bad as I <laughs> the, uh, On the uh, uh, copyright for software and, uh, and for that, the, this is a problem that we have to find a way to make sure that uh, creators do get uh, compensation, but at the same time, that people can fix their problems in their computer. And I believe it's because of DRM, is get rid of DRM, or excuse me, the law preventing you. The DRM is nothing. We can easily get rid of DRM. It's the law that makes it illegal. Get rid of that law and allow people to work on the uh, on their own devices and fix them. Um, uh, have you heard of Error 53? Uh, here, have you heard of Error 53 with your iPhone? Is if you get your iPhone fixed by a non-iPhone dealer, a non-Apple dealer, um, the next time you upgrade your operating system, it, it, turns, it turns your iPhone into a brick. It's useless. And they do that deliberately. Um, I must say, 
uh, they did it deliberately, but there's been a public outcry on it, and I believe that now it's, they don't do that anymore. But that's the type of thing that they want to do and are able to do. And I thought I agreed with you on everything. Was there something that, we're, that I need to <laughs> discuss about that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, just like Amakanisi from the Faculty of Arts, Law and Education, just as uh, you're saying the technology is racing fast, my, my brain too was racing fast when <laughs> you, know, you were explaining um, you know, the, the changes that is happening right now. Uh, my question is, you know, it's all about openness and um, you know, with uh, copyright, there is some control there about, uh, you know, um, and my question really is where in all this, where does the ethics and, um, you know, come in, in, into all this openness and all this um, uh, thing about the, the technology? I'm just beginning to get a bit worried about, you know, the way it's all all moving now, and again, like what the AD Learning and Teaching is saying, there's, there's just two choices there. It's either you remain in an institution, or you just go out and do your own thing out there. So I just, I just want you to, uh, to say, would this be the scenario for the next how many years to come, that that is where education is going to move? It's a scary. Uh, to me, it's very scary. So I want to really ask, in all this, where do you see, you know, the question of ethics coming? Because we do have a course here. There's, there's, in, in yeah. university course, uh, okay. it's, it's, it's just, a, I want to ask that. Um, it's a, a very good question, and there's a very strong issue of ethics here. I believe that it's unethical um, to, uh, when all kinds of content is available and is, uh, is freely available to people on the internet, it's unethical to keep it from them and to put it behind a firewall. There's something unethical about that. If you had all the food to feed everybody in the world and you decided, no, we're gonna keep these people from getting food and it costs you nothing to distribute the food and you, and you stop them from getting the food, that is extremely unethical. I see knowledge that way that we have all the internet now, we can distribute knowledge, all the knowledge in the world we can distribute to people. And there are people putting walled gardens, lock, digital locks on it, restrictive copyright, and unethically stopping us from uh, reaching that knowledge. So yes, there's a really strong ethical component here. And I'm not against um, authors getting paid for their work. I believe they should get paid for their work. but. Uh, uh, here's one for you uh, about ethics. 70 years after the death of the author, this is ethical? That uh, dead people control uh, the, the content that's been produced? That dead people have more control over, you, over the information than live people? That we're allowing the dead to control things? How is that ethical? So, yeah, there's huge ethical issues here, and I believe that uh, um, in the old days, um, this copyright thing is very new historically. This is not a, 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 an old phenomenon. In the old days, copyists were the most respected people in the world. They had them in the monasteries copying parchments and copying knowledge. They had it at the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, copying a scrolls. These were the most respected people in the world. And now there's something evil, something unethical about saying that copying is a crime. Copying is not a crime. Copying, in fact, is the very essence of education and learning. What are we doing when we're teaching? We're copying. We're copying it, and we're ensuring that students can copy. Sure. 
Use your mic. Sorry, this is assuming that all that we learn is good for society. There's an assumption here that all, you know, the knowledge is good for society, which means if I learned, let me give an example, to falsify my tax return, you know, <laughs> I mean, that just comes to mind. If I learn that, and then I've learned to do it, or I learn to go and burgle, you know, and get inside somebody's house and steal whatever is there, you know, what does that make me? I'm, I'm learning, but, you know, it's, it's uh, in my personal view, it's, you know, stealing or learning to falsify. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I, I want to know because here I'm hearing as if knowledge is very good, whatever you learn is all good. I'm not hearing the other side as well that whatever you learn can be either good to society or bad to society. Sorry, I'm just excited about what you say. I, I really want to Okay, uh, I'm sorry if I gave you the impression that it's all good. It isn't, I fully agree with you. People can learn bad things. And when I was talking about video games, I was hoping that the students were learning good things. And we know that's not always the case with video game. They're learning things that uh, perhaps we'd rather they didn't learn. I'll tell you, the, the average person today knows more than the um, most educated people in the Middle Ages. An average person, just from television. But what they know are things that maybe we don't want them to know. <laughs> maybe they shouldn't know, right? But they know a lot. They know all about the Kardashians and they know about uh, all kinds of uh, soap operas and they know this and they know all of the stars on the television and they know all of this stuff. And as educators, we don't value that knowledge very much but they do know it, so it's not all good. I'm sorry I gave you that impression, but my view is that the more knowledge we spread, and by knowledge I think I mean real education. I'm not into spreading the Kardashians and all of these the soap opera things. I, I, I don't support that at all. I'm not against it, let people do it, but that's not me. I don't, uh, I don't think it's very good, so I think we, we agree. I'm sorry. I made out that it was all good and wonderful and everything. Thank you. I, 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 I want to give the Vice Chancellor a, a chance, but, but I have just one, one, one question that I, 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 I've invited the panelists here and they've had only one go. Here's, here's another go. Um, assuming that you, know, you have some agreement uh, on open access and open learning and open scholarship, you know, those attributes of open education we're talking about, even if you don't, completely buy into the idea. From, from your faculty's point of view and Libby from the library's point of view, what do you think needs to be done to tip the balance towards more openness as opposed to being closed? Want to go? Yeah, go. Thank you. From the library's perspective, what would tip the balance? We look out to see what's out there. We have on our website lists of open educational resources for academic staff to look at and to make recommendations to their students through their course proposals, etc. However, we find that academics are not referring to them and not using them. And in a discussion that we had internally, we were wondering why these are not appearing as much on the course proposals as we would like to see. We have liaison librarians who have to recommend and say, have you looked at this? And the conclusion we came to is academics don't go into OERs and produce OERs because they don't get the rewards, perhaps, that they get if they produce materials that are published uh, by commercial publishers. Um, there's also, I think, a, and I might be wrong, but it's something that came up, a concern that the quality, and I think um, uh, that was referred to, 
of those materials. So do we have criteria that assesses the ranked items against the OER and a similar setup? So I think we try to do what we can by putting the materials out there. We rely on the academics to come forward, see what's there, analyze them for their purpose, or to how it fits their purpose, and to use them. But we still have a large number saying we need all these databases, and then we're linked to accreditations. So we have to get the commercial. So we're trying to balance the commercial against the, the OERs that are out there. And we can only push so much, but we need a change in mindset, which, which does take time. Thank you. I, I also liked the reference earlier to focusing on learning uh, as a process, as opposed to focusing on the learner. Uh, so I'm going to talk about tipping the balance from the perspective of the student. So what would tip the balance towards students actually picking up these resources uh, and using them. And um, by all accounts from the staff in our faculties, what really tips the balance is when we begin to link uh, anything to assessment. Um, that is when we find students actually sitting up, taking notice, accessing the resources, using them. So I think what would tip the balance in terms of the students is when academics actually think through um, what OERs are going to be relevant, are going to be very helpful, useful for learning, and then make sure that this is signaled by linking them to assessment tasks. Uh, and I'm not saying, not talking about an assessment task for the sake of assessment, but what we call assessment for learning. I think that would really, that would help uh, towards tipping the balance. Yeah. So, uh, with respect to OER, which we want to see as science and technology prospects, uh, mainly I would like to see first opportunities that what I can see from my prospects, what my experience with faculty colleagues, that we do offer many science uh, programs, so current based, where our students are working students, they are, they are remotely located, and, and uh, most of the time we want to see their flexibilities and the time to take up the course and materials, so, so that's obviously the good opportunity if we adopt and go towards OER for, for delivering some units uh, uh, to regional, and some practical aspects, they do come 20% of time to regional campus or to here, uh, because we cannot replace uh, physical laboratory tasks which we wanted to train and uh, give their uh, exercise. So, so yeah, it, there is opportunities that we would like to build up, but same time there are challenges. Our regional universities and regional uh, countries are not equipped with well internets. It's also the cost associated with this. So we cannot randomly pick up many OERs and resources that we keep on giving them to review this, read this, and it's a free and you can find out. But how about the internet and uh, the accessibility of that materials? So we have that challenges. So I think we need to work on some tablet-based learning and where we host some intranet, uh, local servers, and cloud, or maybe material-based tablets available to them so that they can able to download that materials which doesn't cost any data. So th these are the two points that's uh, pros and cross, but we are uh, trying to make a way on it. So, but on the top of that, uh, I, I, I just uh, uh, having one question. Why, while we see this open education resources for free for, for to use, uh, if we are not commercializing it, we are not making profit out of it. Suppose we developed any OER, even sometimes we, uh, as uh, we are recommended to suggest some OER materials related to your unit uh, mat uh, course delivery. So we do use for our uh, online delivery or for face-to-face -face also. We are now giving some of the links which are available online. Suppose MITs and some course are fully developed very nicely videos and uh, lecture uh, are available. But this is for free for non-commercial purpose. But some students are registering the course online mode, but they do pay fees to the university. So university is making money out of it. So will they consider as a bridge or uh, an issue? Because OER is free to use. However, university is making money by getting the registrations fee. So, so that's, that's the...
Uh, that's a, a very good point, and there's a, a, a big discussion going on with Creative Commons about the uh, um, fee, the, the, the licensing fees, and uh, universities, and are they, are they making money on it? And what they found out is that the uh, non-commercial license um, is interpreted differently by every person who puts the license on and they all have a different interpretation. My interpretation is that if it's a non-profit non institution, you can use it uh, non-commercially, and I believe most agree with that, but not all. Um, but my view is uh, assume that, and if somebody has a problem with it, they'll let you know. Um, uh, after the lecture, I believe I would have liked to have uh, pointed out more clearly because of uh, questions that, uh, that were asked uh, is that uh, we're supporting open educational resources for use and not for creation. And uh, uh, some people seem to have had the uh, perception that we were looking at uh, and supporting the creation of open educational resources at the university when in fact we're supporting using open educational resources that are freely available now on the internet as much as possible. And we support the creation of uh, uh, open educational resources only in those areas where there is nothing at all available. And uh, in most subject areas there's quite a, a few very good, uh, uh, well-structured uh, open educational resources evaluated by professionals, evaluated by faculty, and uh, these should be used and incorporated into courses. And I call it assembling open educational resources rather than uh, creating uh, open educational resources. And I think that's something that uh, perhaps I didn't stress enough uh, during the lecture. And uh, I uh, I, I feel that that's a very important uh, aspect of open educational resources and one of the main reasons why we support open educational resources. The use of them should make it easier for the faculty and uh, less costly uh, for the students. Okay, uh, uh, to follow up I'd like to, uh, uh, well first of all, uh, thank the university for the uh, invitation to come and work with you and to uh, discuss open educational resources. And also I'd like to uh, uh, mention just how uh, pleased I was with the three workshops uh, that were conducted and uh, I was uh, very impressed by the level of interest of uh, the faculty at the university and uh, their level of commitment where they uh, 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 they, they work continuously, all three groups work continuously throughout the two hours searching for and finding uh, relevant open educational resources that uh, they could fit into their courses. And uh, in, uh, uh, in every case there were faculty who even stayed over after the two hours because of the interest. And I'm hoping that they can share this in their interest with other faculty members and ensure the spread of the use of open educational resources at USP. So once again, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation to uh, Sam Naidu and to Deepak for uh, uh, escorting me around and helping me here. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I think that uh, it shows that USP is putting leadership, is becoming a leader in the implementation of open educational resources, uh, not just on campus, but internationally. So thank you once again. Well, thank you, Rory. Thank you very much for making the time to come and speak with us and for your presentation. Thank you all for uh, attending the session. I hope uh, we found uh, it useful, invigorating, exciting, controversial nonetheless. Um, uh, one of the things that I, I, I think would have been, uh, been very clear to all of us is that um, engagement with open education is not entirely new for this university. 
the University of the South Pacific has been in the business of uh, offering open access to educational opportunity through distance education, through non-formal education, through uh, pre-university studies. So there's various pathways uh, which the university has been employing to open up access to educational opportunity. So that's one part of open educational practices. And the second part, of course, is open learning, open learning strategies. And that too, this university has been very familiar with over many, many years in terms of how it provides flexibility in terms of the time, place, and pace of study. But the, the third part of that equation is, is something that, that we are not that familiar with, and that's the practice of open scholarship, which is what Rory's been talking about, opening up access to knowledge creation and the use of knowledge and especially knowledge that has been supported by the use of public funds. And uh, I think that's a, that's, that's, that's a conversation that we need to have and we are, we are having and we will continue to have. So I'm looking forward to those exciting, exciting times ahead. Uh, with those closing remarks, I'd like to thank everybody who has been able to put this together, in particular Deepak, Deepak Bhartu has been um, leading the team, uh, Sarome and various other people who have helped uh, uh, put this event together at such short notice and um, under difficult circumstances. So I uh, appreciate all their help and thank you all for coming to this session. Good night.